presentation that I'm going to deliver is something around passwords. And the question, are we finally getting past passwords? So this is a technology that I know we're all familiar with. It's something that we've been using for years, as have many other IT users. But for many years now, in conjunction with our use of passwords, there's been quite significant criticism of the technology and the fact that users themselves can introduce weaknesses and the fact that the password mechanisms, if you use them correctly, are not necessarily as easy as other technologies that might be available. So, as I say, it's an area of security that everybody does tend to encounter to at least some degree and quite often on a very regular basis, even during a single day, you find yourself encountering many requirements to identify and then authenticate yourself using a password. And in general terms, the traditional methods could be argued to be quite usable in the context that it's relatively easy for a user to understand the theory, to understand the idea of what a password is there to do. It's regulating the level of access that they should have based upon a secret that only they should know. And also it has the advantage of being familiar across different systems. So once you've encountered the technology on one system, you don't really need it re-explained to you for use on others. So it's a fairly transferable skill in that context. And that has an advantage for the developers and the providers of sites and services that are password-based because there's no, if you like, training overhead for new users to those services. They can be pretty much relied upon to have encountered passwords already somewhere else, and so they can just get on and use them. The problem, though, or part of the problem that can arise is the ease of use, or a level of it, often comes because users aren't actually using passwords in quite the way that we and the guidance around passwords would suggest that they should. Okay, so if we just remind ourselves of what I've told you, the standard stuff, the bits that you hear all the time around password good practice, and then you think about the degree to which some users don't comply with this if they're given the opportunity not to. So first bit of standard guidance is to choose a password of at least a certain number of characters in length. And X there, you can, well, depending on the, the guidelines you look at, X might be 8, 9, 10, 14, etc. As, as technology has advanced and means of cracking passwords has advanced, then you need to choose longer passwords in order to safeguard them against that sort of approach. Okay, so brute force attacks, use of rainbow tables, etc. So even now, there's no standardization across websites, if you look, as to the length of password that they would expect as a baseline. You need to include a combination of character types, so alphabetic characters, numeric characters, special symbols, punctuation symbols, to increase the character space and therefore complicate the task for a brute force attack. You're advised to change your password regularly, certainly on what I've termed their important systems. So on certain sites and services, perhaps it wouldn't be relevant to consider doing that, but things where you're storing something of value, then it would be good advice to follow, because if somebody has managed to compromise your password, changing it will put them back to square one, and they would have to, to re-compromise it again. And it's useful to consider schemes to help you remember passwords more easily, but there isn't necessarily a consensus on what those schemes ought to be, and indeed some types of scheme will work better for some users than others. And I've got one example, at least, towards the end of the talk. And then there's the things that people shouldn't do. They shouldn't choose words that you can find in a dictionary, because they are, well, A, a potentially predictable choice, and also password cracking or auditing tools will generally tend to have a pre-encrypted set of dictionary words within them, such that if your password is based upon one of those, then it can be found pretty much instantly via a lookup, rather than having to do any sort of brute force attack. Don't choose a password that somebody could guess. So don't base it upon personal information, things that somebody close to you would know about you, or indeed something that somebody might be able to social engineer from you. Um, the sort of thing, family names, pet names, all those sort of things that somebody could quite easily acquire from you in casual conversation. Don't share the password with anybody else, including your friends, family, colleagues. They might look like they've got trustworthy faces, but sometimes they will then take your password and access your account and do what they had in mind to do with it. It's always nice if you're going to do something that's slightly inappropriate via a system to do it under somebody else's identity rather than your own. Don't write your password down. Well, some guidance will say don't write it down at all. I've added here, don't write it down where it could be found. So the, the classic thing of passwords being written on post-it notes and stuck to monitors or under keyboards, etc. You'd sort of hope that you wouldn't encounter that in practice, but 
actually, you, you actually do. It, those, those stories are based upon truth. Um, but making a note of the password, or at least better, a password reminder of some, some sort, something that will be meaningful to you but wouldn't be meaningful to anybody else if they were to come across it, that's, that's a reasonable thing to do and could be a good element of password management if you're trying to satisfy all of the other elements of good practice. And don't use the same password for all the systems that you use, because that's basically putting all of your eggs into one basket. If one account is compromised, you're then putting all of the others at risk. But this advice is all very well in theory, but putting this into practice can actually be quite tricky, because the sheer number of systems that we use that, that require us to have a password I means don't use the same password or don't repeat the use of <coughs> passwords across multiple sites and services is going to be a bit of a challenge unless you're really disciplined in terms of the way you do it. So, so, practically all aspects of that guidance actually serve to make the passwords more difficult to use than was originally stated. So, okay, users tend to like them or accept them because they find them easy to get on with, but they find them easy to get on with very often because they're not using them properly. So, if you're enforcing the selection criteria, that's something that makes a password perhaps less memorable, perhaps less easy to type than a, a purely alphabetic password, for example. If you have to change them regularly, that's increasing the cognitive load on you in terms of remembering, well, what password is it now for this account? Did, is it the one I used yesterday, or did I change it, and whatever else. And doing that, of course, across multiple systems can be comp uh, complicated, unless, of course, you've so made a useful reminder to yourself and are referencing that, but even then, the task of consulting whatever your password management approach is, is going to add to the time that it takes to actually perform the login and the authentication. So having to, to look up the, the clue, the reminder to your password for the account, you know, that could take you 30, 60 seconds in addition to the, the quick task of typing the username and password in. Avoiding reuse, avoiding a, an easily locatable written record, that, that again adds to the complexity. And of course, using passwords across multiple systems amplifies the degree of challenge involved. So every additional password-based account that you've got, the more of a challenge as a result. So password management tools can help here, but then it's the process of retrieving the passwords from whatever approach you're using that adds a level of overhead. And again, that overhead, maybe it's only 30 seconds, 60 seconds, but for some users, even that might not be a particularly tolerable level, and they will therefore choose to bypass it and revert to bad practice. And I say, there, there are quite a number of things that require us to use passwords on quite a regular basis. So here, just from my selection of everyday uses, are the passwords that I come into contact with at least once a day, very often many times more. So there's the password for my encrypted USB key, there's password for a Windows system, password for using the VPN um, when I connect back to the university, and the password that I'm required to type on the, the computer that I use for the majority of my work. So that, that's just the device-oriented stuff. And then there's various websites that I also use on a daily basis, all of which are, again, presenting passwords. And this isn't an exhaustive selection, this is just a, a sample of the ones that will definitely get used um, every day or so. So the university, a uh, couple of journals that I do editorial work for and reviewing, and uh, in well, one particular example of another site, the iTunes U service that we upload quite a lot of our security related content to. So log in there to see how the downloads are going to collect stats. So that's eight things that I use on a daily basis, all using different passwords, so I have to remember those. And that's it. Frequently, I'm spending time typing passwords in. So, the website examples are potentially interesting, or the website context more generally is worth a bit more of a look. And I'm going to draw attention here to some work that we did back in, well, actually, September of 2011. So, this is illustrative rather than um, definite information that's still current. It was certainly, re uh, certainly accurate at the time. What I did here was to look at the way that 10 of the most popular websites, according to the Alexa Global Top 500, which lists the most accessed sites, how these 10 of the most popular sites present their password guidance to users and the extent to which they enforce what could be regarded as good practice. So going back to those earlier bits of standard stuff, what do websites actually require of users in that respect? Um, I say, and there's 
couple of aspects coming off this. One, the password practices are going to be exposed to a fair number of users through these sites. So this is what many users will see as standard, normal things to require in terms of passwords. And it might be that these sites also provide a baseline that other website providers would look at and say, okay, what does Google, for example, use, or what does um, MSN, or what does Facebook use as a basis for its authentication for account holders? And if it's good enough for them, then it's good enough for our site, and we'll follow that model as well. So, just to illustrate again, the, the plethora of different password style interfaces across some of these sites, that's what they look like, if you're just familiar with those anyway. And let's have a look at some of the, the results. So in terms of password guidance, were users given any guidance in terms of how to select a password when they created an account? Now, in some cases, they weren't given very much that was tangible. Um, eBay and Google at the time were the best in terms of they actually had links to something that was a list of password guidance, like those do's and don'ts, and in some cases, an explanation as to why. So what I didn't have on the earlier slide was a narrative to explain why somebody shouldn't use a dictionary word. I, I told you in the context of the presentation. But very often, you see guidance provided with little explanation. And I think to get people's buy-in to understand, well, why the hell should I do that? Explaining it to them is a fair thing to expect. So these sites had some guidance, and it, to some degree it was explanatory. And they were covering things like the selection and composition of passwords, advice against recording the password and divulging them to other people, and also suggestions around changing them and avoiding reuse across different services. So it's covering some of the good bases there. Both of them also provided password strength meters. So interactively, as the users were typing their passwords in, they would get some sort of rating as to whether it was strong, medium, weak, etc. And that, again, could encourage you. Know, so if you get something rated weak, and if the, particularly if the site doesn't allow you to proceed with a weak password, you're forced to change it. But even if the site would allow you to proceed, having something of yours rated as weak maybe is an encouragement to, to go a bit better and to try harder. Okay, And what they were also doing was filtering out, in the, the password strength meter for Google at least, filtering out obvious choices. So it was preventing you from using, for example, the word password as your chosen password choice. So let's have a look at some of the, the strength meter examples. So in the eBay one, it wasn't one of these that we'll see in a moment where you've got the bar going up and down saying medium, strong, weak, but it was giving you the, the password essentials that you ought to be satisfying and showing you which ones were and weren't satisfied by the current choice that you typed in. Okay, so the password is required to meet the specified criteria before you can proceed. Um, and uh, basically, each of these four points gets kicked off as you meet it. However, it's not perfect because, for example, me typing in the password choice of Fennel1 wouldn't be a particularly strong choice for me, but it's something that this would nonetheless have accepted. And it is something that could be guarded against if, as part of the login or the registration procedure, you collect the user's name. And then you can use that to guard against them using their name as part of the password. Windows Live, um, the password meter at the time looked like this. So you can see it's one of the, the bar strength ones. And this is looking at a variety of characteristics. You needed to have at least three different types of characters and at least seven characters long um, to be rated as strong. But nonetheless, Fennel 1 would still have been rated strong in that context. So it's still not great, but at least it was providing something which was significantly better than some of the others. Any two character types and at least seven characters long was rated as medium, and otherwise it was rated as weak. So they're trying to get you over a baseline threshold of password length. Still not wonderful, but better than some, as we shall see. And Google's one... Um, gives four levels of rating, um, and you can see the rules that it was applying there. Fennel1, notably, was yet again rated as a strong password against this system. So, key message here is it's useful, but it's not infallible, and it still does require the user to exercise some level of knowledge about what a good and bad password might look like. Now, that was the guidance that was provided. What was also interesting to look at was the level of enforcement of password rules. So you saw in the eBay 
one that it was looking for you to get tips against all the criteria. Some of the other sites didn't go that far. Um, so we've got the full list of sites. So we've um, got Amazon, eBay, Facebook, Google, LinkedIn, Twitter, Wikipedia, Windows Live, WordPress, and Yahoo. If you were to actually look at that Alexa top 500, what you, you wouldn't find these as being the top 10, but what you would find is various national versions of Google, so the US, the Indian, the UK, etc. So all the Google approaches were the same, so we just had a look at one of them, um, but in the top 10 list you might have five different variants of Google sites, for example. And these were the restrictions that we looked at to see, okay, what that was feasible to check was actually being checked and enforced by these sites. So one thing was the password length, and it might not be very readable here, due to my excellent choice of uh, colours, um, but the majority of them um, were insisting on a minimum length of six characters, which is not wonderful. Google was the best, insisting on a minimum length of eight. Um, WordPress only wanted four characters, and Wikipedia didn't care. You could have a one-character password for Wikipedia and still create an account. Now, interesting, well, I think it's interesting, um, I did, this was the second time I'd done this exercise, and I'd done it a few years earlier, and at that time, Amazon also allows you to have a one-character password. Didn't complain about it at all. And that one-character password could then protect, if that's the right word for a one-character password, your payment card details and your purchasing power that you basically lodged and saved on Amazon. And we can see here, that at least in late 2011, Amazon wasn't doing particularly well on the rest of the criteria by that point either. So the other ones I looked at were, did it restrict you from using the, your surname? Did it restrict you from reusing your user ID, the thing that you just selected as your login name? as the password? Did it prevent you from using the word password as a password? Did it prevent you from using some other dictionary words? So I used about three, I can't remember what they were now, but I used three other dictionary words as a basis for testing was there any dictionary checking. Did, were there enforcements on password composition, so looking for different character types within the password? And if you went to the password reset facility of the site, did it prevent you reusing a password that you'd already had? And as you can see here from the number of red crosses across the table, not all of the sites were particularly good at enforcing all of these possible restrictions. And they were also variable in terms of whether they provided a password meter to the user. Okay, so I, I gave eBay, by the way, a sort of a partial password meter because of the way that one was implemented, and you saw that compared to the others. So not great in terms of actually enforcing good practice either. Not great in terms of providing the guidance up front. So perhaps not surprising that the sort of password choices that many users would come out of from these sites would not be to the best of their ability or indeed the best protection that you'd want. And in some of the cases, so particularly I think it's apparent with, say, social networks, what they were looking to do, or what perhaps they are looking to do, is not put too many barriers in the way of you signing up to the service. Okay? And so you can see from their perspective why putting potentially complex password enforcement up front is not going to be helpful. But at the same time, in terms of safeguarding their users and actually trying to, to provide some sort of support for good online security practice, I think they could do more. Okay, so password enforcements were variable. The length, um, most went for six. A couple of the sites enforced a maximum length, which I didn't think was particularly helpful. Why would you necessarily want one? Um, other checks were excluded. Some, in some cases, the sites did inform that the user hadn't done something. So, for example, when you were typing something in and you get something with a password meter saying it was weak, yeah, it would tell you, but it would still let you proceed with that choice. Um, now, so some of the sites could say, uh, their argument could be that actually the, the checks that they're making are commensurate with the data that users are storing on the site. So they're not, perhaps, storing very sensitive data, financial information, etc. And so perhaps they don't need the highest level of security. I say, what that does do, though, is overlooks the fact that users might take this as an example of acceptable practice and then decide, OK, it was rated strong there, or it was rated medium there. I'll use that password on a site that I'm actually storing something more sensitive on. And my thought would be that it'd be better for these sites to contribute to this overall community ethos, if you like, of building a safer online population. Now, moving on from this, um, a bit of further related stuff, something from a, a small survey that we did um, more recently, um, asked 
what was it, 246 responds, how many passwords or how many password-based accounts do they actually have? And it, to some degree, I think these are quite conservative findings. So about a third of them said that they had 16 or more accounts or devices that they were using that were password-based, and relatively few had between only one and five passwords. So you can see that people do face a tangible password management challenge if they're trying to follow the advice properly. What we also asked them as part of this was which of a series of the following statements were actually true for their, the password for their most important account. So think about the thing they valued most that was password protected and which of the following applied. So was it at least eight characters long? Well, most people said it was. Um, does it have alphabetic and numeric characters in it? Does it have other characters, punctuation symbols, special symbols, etc.? Is it a word you would find in the dictionary? Um, is it based on personal information about you? Have you changed it since you started using it? Um, do you change it regularly? Have you shared it with others? And have you ever forgotten it and had to reset or recover it? Now, these first five, if you like, are based upon their password selection practice, and the others are based upon their, their management and use of the password after having chosen it. So you can see that in each of these cases, that the it's the minority of people that seem to be doing the wrong thing. So uh, only 16% um, don't have alphabetic and numeric characters in their password. But if we were to look at all of these, the top five, and say, for somebody to have a, a baseline good password, they ought to be able to respond positively to all, or have the right answer to all five of these. Looking across our respondents then, only about 24, 25% of the respondents actually fell into that category. So most of them, three quarters of them, were failing on one of these criteria. Okay? So although taken individually, the results are reasonably okay, it's sort of four-fifths of people are doing it right at least, across the board with all those criteria, they're not doing quite so well at all. So one thing that we then thought as a consequence of that was, and having seen that many sites don't provide password advice, would them providing password advice improve the situation? Would this actually help people to, to do it better? Just by telling them, not enforcing it, just putting the guidance there in a meaningful way so they can see it, you know, not bloody pages of it, but something brief and to the point. And so this is something that we, we've done with currently um, a small number of participants, and this is, we're, we're, this is ongoing research, this is early findings. So we basically scored people out of five for these five criteria that were at the top of the previous table. Did they have a password of at least eight characters? It's not great, but it was the best that we saw from the examples of the websites we'd looked at before. Did it have uh, alphabetic and numeric characters? Does it have punctuation symbols? Has it avoided using a dictionary word? And has it avoided using personal information about them as a user? So what we found, and we had, I say, only 27 participants, so the, the, you, know, you wouldn't generalise from these results, but um, what we found was that the average score for unguided users, so those for which we didn't provide any, any guidance, and it's, and it's worth me saying, actually, that the users involved in this study didn't realise that they were being part of a password study. They were basically using a website and being asked to evaluate the usability of the website. And it just so happened that the first thing they needed to do as part of the study was to select a username and password with which to register themselves as a participant. So they didn't realise that the focus of actually what we were really interested in was this. So for the unguided users, their average score was 1.8. And for the guided users, it was 3.8. So a tangible difference there amongst the participants. And you can see that those people, for example, using at least eight characters were far more pronounced if they were guided than if they were unguided. Those that chose to use other characters, so more than just alphanumeric within the passwords, were much better with guidance. So it's relatively small numbers in each population group. So, but nonetheless interesting, I think. And the fact was these things weren't enforced they were just presented the guidance and then allowed to do whatever they liked. So yeah, they could have completely ignored the fact of the guidance, and of course some of them did. It wasn't 100% across the board. But it, it made a tangible difference that they were guided and then did something better. So that perhaps gives a lesson for what websites could do to make a, a small but potentially noticeable contribution to improving practices. Okay, let's look more widely then to uh, some of the other evidence that... Uh, 
password practice is not great at the moment. So a recent survey from Ofcom in the UK looked at adult internet users, um, almost 2,000 of them we could say, and what they discovered was that more than half of them were using the same password across multiple websites. How many people in the room do that? Okay. The camera's not on you, so I won't report the findings, but there are about half the people in the room. 25% um, of them reported problems remembering their passwords, and 26% a quarter um, used easy-to-remember passwords, so things based on personal information, their, their names, family names, birthdays, etc. It's also been established that Lax password practices are a key threat to organisations. Now, this was uh, something that was noted in a keynote presentation from a conference we held last week in Lisbon. Our keynote speaker, Ram Herkinaidu from Kaspersky Lab, was he just happened to be talking about targeted attacks against organisations and flagged up the two key reasons that these attacks have been possible. One was the use of spear phishing email messages, so targeted phishing attempts to users within the organisation, and the others was lacked password practice, the fact that the passwords being used were weak and therefore easily compromised and giving a route in to those victim organisations. Something else that was actually presented within the conference was a paper from uh, a Norwegian author who had surveyed a thousand respondents there um, and what they found was that they had a minimum of 25 password based accounts per respondent. Um, across their use in work and personal context. You know, a fairly significant number of password-based accounts, more, more so than our results showed. And they were then asked how had they received password education. 59% claimed to have received guidance, 35% said they hadn't, 6% couldn't remember whether they had it or not. And it was interesting, I thought it was interesting, the sources of guidance that they reported receiving. So newspapers or websites was the most prominent, so okay, reflecting the fact that some websites do and some don't. What I thought was particularly notable was that less than a quarter of them reported getting guidance in the workplace. Now given that a lot of these password-based accounts would have been in relation to work-based devices or systems, one of the things you would expect an organisation to try and do to protect itself, given the previous information about targeted attacks, for example, is to provide guidance to their users on how to select a decent password to actually protect the organisation. But very few people were reporting that that was a source of guidance that they'd had. Okay, so getting past passwords then. So, I say, passwords and pins we can also put into this, this category are baseline mechanisms, baseline methods. And yeah, we know that they've got weaknesses, we've flagged up a few of them already, but it does become hard to go beyond them because of the applicability, or otherwise, of alternative techniques to all the different devices that we're trying to get access from. So if we think about traditional desktop or laptop devices, okay, maybe they quite easily support other mechanisms, but when you think about smartphones, tablets, internet kiosks and all the rest, the other things that we might come into contact with or want to come into contact with our online accounts through, can we be sure that they will support any mechanism that isn't just basically requiring a keyboard or a, a, a virtual keyboard to enter this sort of information. So biometrics, for example, require very often additional technology to be there as part of the, the device. So fingerprint recognition, yes, it's very strong, but it requires the device to have a fingerprint reader. Some devices now do as standard, but many still don't. Um, face recognition requires a camera, and that is becoming some, far more of a baseline technology within all of the types of devices we're used to seeing now, but it's still not absolutely everywhere. Voice recognition requires a microphone. Iris recognition requires a more specialist um, camera device. Token-based authentication, so basically authenticating based on the possession of something, or you need smart cards, you need devices like RSA Secure ID in order to be able to, for example, generate one-time codes. So it's something that you've got to have with you. And I say, in, in these contexts, you can't rely upon users having all these things unless you as a service provider actually provide them, okay? um, or as an organisation, as an employer, for instance. 
And even then, some of the technologies that you want to use won't work across all of the devices that you might have. So you might have a fingerprint reader on your laptop, for example, but not on your tablet device. And then if you want to access the same service through the tablet, you can't do so. So the upshot is we, we generally end up relying on those fairly low rent mechanisms that don't make many assumptions about the device's capabilities. And so, and that, that leads to the fact that uh, it's because they're able to work across all of these types of devices, not necessarily uniformly easily, but you know, your desktop, laptop, smartphone, tablet, games consoles, set-top boxes, public internet kiosks, the things you see at airports, etc. All of these things will let you use a password in some way. You know, on a set-top box or a games console, you might end up entering it via a fairly odd controller, scrolling across and clicking from an on-screen keyboard, but at least the mechanism works slowly. Um, so anything that provides a, a keyboard-style interface is equipped to use them. But it doesn't mean they work well in all of those contexts, and that becomes, a, a, again, a bit of a bugbear for users. So let's look at an example of trying to use passwords in a, well, a context that doesn't involve a full standard keyboard. So entering them on some types of mobile device can be a bit of a pest. Um, and it's perhaps too much of an overhead if it's a device that, if you're like me, phone is in and out of your pocket you know, every few minutes or something to check something, look at email, check an appointment, etc. And if you're having to type a password each time, um, given the rigmarole it can potentially involve to type a decent password, then that's a disincentive to doing it, or a disincentive to having the authentication mechanism kick in very quickly. So you might say, okay, I'll, do, I'll have that mechanism, but I'll make it kick in only after 15, 20 minutes, as opposed to maybe after a minute of no use. So, awkward to use, particularly if you follow the advice to use different character types, so alphabetic, numeric, punctuation symbols. So let's have a look. Um, so I've chosen a particular password string that I would enter, so it's the very secure bad password there, um, using upper and lowercase alphabetic special symbols and uh, a numeric in there, in the, in the word. And this is entering it on an iPhone, and so you have to switch between different versions of the keyboard to get to all of these characters. And I say, although it's only a, what is it, 10, 11 character string there, it's something that's requiring quite a lot of fiddling about and potentially making mistakes and, and generally getting annoyed with it to, to try and enter it. So for me, this you know, took, took me quite a while actually to manage to do this successfully enough to get these different screenshots. Um, and so I don't use a password of that nature on my smartphone. I, do use, I don't use that password on anything, by the way, so don't try using bad passwords to log into my account. But I do use passwords on um, online sites, on the, the devices with full keyboards. But on the smartphones, and I guess this is going to be true for other users as well, you sort of gravitate to something that is easier and quicker to enter, to reflect the fact that the device is in and out of your pocket. Now, personally, I don't use the standard four-digit PIN because I don't feel that's secure enough given the type of information that you can now end up storing on a smartphone, which very much could mirror the sensitive data, personal or work-based, that you have on a, a full PC. What I use is a, a fairly long numeric-only string. Okay? I can enter that fairly easily via the larger keys with my big clumsy fingers, but it's better than that, the, the four-digit PIN, the standard one, but it's not as good as having a, a proper password. But entering the proper password is too inconvenient for me on that device. Now there are things that people are doing that various service providers are now doing to try and take us beyond just relying on the passwords. So here's an example from Google that they've been running for a few years now, two-step verification. So you can protect your Google account, um, Gmail, etc., by having an additional numeric code that you need to provide in addition to the password, particularly if you're accessing it from a device that you've never accessed a service from before. Okay, so uh, you can get the, the codes in various ways. It can be an SMS sent to your, your phone or a, a voice message um, sent to your phone. On smartphones, you can get an app that does it, so like the one shown on the screen. Um, you can also get a set of backup codes that you can generate and then print from the Google site and keep in your wallet or something. And all of these are one-time codes. Um, and 
If you want to make your life a little bit easier, you can have it such that you don't have to provide a code every time you use a device. You can choose to remember a computer for up to 30 days and then re-enter the code then. So you're periodically re-verifying in a stronger way. But of course, this is something that adds a level of complexity to the, the password approach. I mean, I think it's quite a good solution, but it does add time to the process. You've now got to do your password and you've got to, to type the code in. Okay, and it might, if you're trying to access a website from your mobile device, switching between the thing that's got the code generated and then switching back to the browser on the mobile device is, is not necessarily the most friendly way to have to do it. And there are other sites that go even further than that. So online banking is a very good example of where the standard user authentication procedure is now well beyond just a username and a password. Um, Here's one from uh, ING Direct, um, and it requires several bits of information to be provided. So prior to this, you have to provide your personal banking number and your surname, and then once you get there, you've got selected digits from your secret PIN code, um, which are um, yeah, not necessarily um, requested from you in numeric order. So here you can see it's asking for the first digit, then the sixth, then the third. So cognitively, you've got to jump around in the thing. It's not as easy as just working through it in sequence. Um, ask you for different ones each time, of course, so the idea here being to prevent key logging. Um, ask you for a memorable <coughs> date, which is another bit of secret information you need to have in mind. And then you've got to enter, um, well, you've got to enter all of that, rather, via this on-screen keypad. And again, while it's got a normal keypad shape, you can see that the numbers there aren't in the normal expected sequence, and the layout of the keypad changes on its use. And again, that's to prevent logging of screen positions, mouse movements, etc. So any malware that you might have on the device trying to capture what you're doing is hopefully thwarted. So it makes it a more involved process, makes it a more robust process, arguably, but it's also a more challenging process for the user, cognitively in terms of having to think through what are the secret digits, and also in terms of being more time-consuming and having to be more careful in terms of, well, where am I clicking to actually enter the numbers? Okay, so I basically said all that. Um, I say more secure, but more challenging, more time-consuming, less usable, arguably, as a result. And some online banking services have gone yet further than that. So here's an example um, from HSBC. Um, any, anybody encountered this approach? I don't know if it's used here in, in Sweden. Um, okay. Um, so what, for those who've not encountered it, what this is is HSBC Secure, I, Secure Key token. And this is provided to all HSBC customers as a means of logging themselves in or helping the login to the online banking. And what they need to do is, after entering their online banking number as normal and also entering the answer to a secret question, they have to use this device to generate a one-time code. And that's done by entering a four-digit pin on the device and then getting it to generate the code, which it displays on its screen, and then you enter that code within a certain time window onto HSBC's website, and that will then let you get access to your account. Okay, so more robust again in the sense that it's relying on a one-time code and it relies upon the user having the device, um, so more difficult for an imposter, perhaps. So according to HSBC's website at the time that this was launched, and it might well say the same thing now, Simple process. Just switch it on, enter your secure key PIN code, and it will give you a unique one-off six-digit passcode each time you want to log on. It's as simple as that. But there wasn't an option for users not to use it. Now, some other online banking services that have provided, for example, card readers that you put your card into to generate a one-time code, they request that perhaps for particularly sensitive activities like setting up a new payee or making a payment transaction, but they don't require it for all logins. And in some cases, they've even backed away from it. So I think Barclays was one early example that provided it in the UK and then backed away and said, okay, you can use that device or you can use a succession of secret questions and, and answer responses to get in instead if you, if you don't want to use the device. HSBC... Not quite like that. There was no option. So if you decide you don't want to upgrade to use the secure key, feel free to call us and opt out of internet banking. So if you don't want to use it, bye bye. Um, which perhaps wasn't the most friendly to the customer's perspective. Um, okay. 
Is it an acceptable trade-off? At least in the banking context, for the user, there's a tangible, recognizable asset that you want to protect. It's your money. But can you imagine this being viable for websites in general? Each provider sending out some token, or even if there was a general purpose token, every provider expecting you to go through an increased level of process. Perhaps not. So I say it wouldn't scale up, particularly if everybody was sending you their own distinct tokens. And even in the case of HSBC, it wasn't necessarily that well received by the, the customer base. So here is an example of a Facebook page that was set up pretty soon after that campaign was launched, um, saying scrap the HSBC secure key, and you, you can see 584 people at the time liked that. So, uh, the, and you found news stories, there's quite a lot, if you were to look around, quite a lot of resentment and resistance to the idea of this being rolled out. Another context in which passwords can be troublesome is when they're just asked for, apparently, for the sake of it. Um, and here's an example that I tend to encounter quite often in uh, Word for Mac when I want to create a PDF of a document. And if I want to prevent somebody from copying the text, copying the content out of that document, I need to password protect it. Okay? And so every time I, I do it, I need to think of a, a, a password of suitable strength that you know, whatever cracking tool somebody might have isn't going to break it. Why should I have to type a password? If I know that I actually don't want to unprotect that document, why not just have the tick box and let the system generate whatever level of security it needs to provide to prevent somebody from doing it? Why do I have to go through the process of thinking about a password there? Now, moving on from passwords, and literally getting past passwords, there are other approaches that can be considered. So here's an example of some early research we did at Plymouth around graphical authentication. And we implemented, this is a version that we implemented for website authentication, but we also did it on some mobile devices as well. And the idea here is that instead of remembering a password string, people remember a sequence of secret images. And what we use in the context of this one, as you can see, is everyday recognizable objects. There have been other studies that have been done that have used more abstract graphical representations and odd shapes and things. We thought everyday objects might be more memorable, easily recognizable, and people might be able to construct some sort of mental storyline that connected the objects together. In the actual system, you wouldn't see them highlighted in this manner. This was just for illustration. But the idea here is they have six images to get, and they're spread across four different, or potentially across four different grids. So if people don't see the images that they want there, they, they scroll to the next ones, etc. And we found that to be reasonably successful, reasonably acceptable to some users. Some didn't like it, though, because it was quite a departure from passwords. But the theory, at least, would be people are better at remembering and recognizing images than they are remembering arbitrary character sets. Of course, they can remember a dictionary word or personal information, but give them a, a meaningless-looking password, and it's, it's more difficult. Another example from some more recent research, um, that, again, that we've done, is the combination of secret images and click points within them. So the idea here is you would have images that you know are your images amongst a set of decoy ones, and then within your images there would be one or more secret points that you've previously nominated that you need to click on to say, okay, these are the bits I remember. So for the sake of argument, I'm taking a very obvious potential click point, could be the football in the first picture there. And that equally flags a potential weakness of such an approach that some of the, the hotspots, the click points, could be quite predictable um, if people have, have chosen inappropriate images. Okay? But nonetheless, this is another thing that we, we've trialled and implemented again, with some degree of success with users. Something that you may have encountered, and this is where, if you like, graphical authentication or one route by which it's come to the masses now, is Windows 8's picture password approach. Has anybody used this particular technology? So the idea here is that you've got an image and within it you have got, again, some secret points and also associated gestures. So you can do clicks, you can draw lines between two points, or you can draw a circle. So, on, so each picture password would have three gestures. They could be all clicks, they could be all lines, they could be two clicks and a, and a circle, whatever. You've got three options for the type of gesture and you apply it wherever in the image you feel it's appropriate. And that was introduced, I, I guess, particularly to be applicable to the touch type devices that Windows 8 is also trying to target, so tablet type interfaces and touch screens on laptops. 
So perhaps quite friendly from the user perspective, in the sense that you can go like that quite quickly, if you can remember where you put the points, or where you put the gestures, and what type of gestures you use. I must admit that I set one of these up, um, you know, just to play around with it, and then promptly forgot what I'd done the next time I came back to use the, the thing, even though at the time it seemed like the, you know, I will certainly remember where I've drawn that line between and what I put a circle around, and then I couldn't. And so what you've got as a, a fallback there is, of course, the password for the account will enable you to reset your picture password. And so potentially what you could also argue there is that this is introducing now two points of potential compromise, the user's standard password and the picture password on the account. But at, le at least it is now a progression into an alternative to passwords that's happening on a large scale. How about this one then? How many people recognize or use this particular approach? Yes. Hands up the Android users. Okay, so several people for that one. Um, and this is Android's <coughs> patent lock or patent unlock. Um, and this is something that is clearly suited to touch devices. It is very suitable in that context for something relatively easy to do, um, hopefully easy to remember, a nice alternative to a password that's suited to that type of device. It's not generally applicable to other devices that don't have a touch interface, for example. Um, potential downsides are complex patterns. So if you have a long pattern, is it hard to remember? Does it end up presenting the same sort of challenge as a password might do? It's potentially more observable than pins. So if you're an onlooker, if you're looking over somebody's shoulder, it's really easy to see what they've done, as opposed to something where they're tapping away with a pin or a password and their finger might be moving across and obscuring things. With one of these, you can actually see the line that they're drawing and you can get a fair idea of it. And even if you can't see the screen, the movement that they make, um, if they're holding it up in front of you and you're just looking at the back of it, you can still see where they're going up and down. Um, observe it enough and it's possible. And sometimes you might not even need to do that. So, um, for example, if you pick up the screen of one of these devices and look at it in the light, you can often see the lines that somebody has left. And I say, I've, I've seen that actually happening. So somebody's picked up a device, looked at it, and got into the device just by looking at the greasy finger marks left on the screen. So needing to remember to choose patterns that double back on themselves so one line on the screen doesn't just go in one direction, so to speak, and also just a bit of phone hiding between the screen every now and again might help to resolve that problem. Okay, biometrics, that's another potential solution for our getting past passwords, so authentication on the basis of something you are as a user. Theoretically, more usable, in the sense you don't have to remember something, the biometrics are something you naturally carry with you. You can't lose them, you can't leave them behind, they don't fall out of your pocket, etc. But there are practical factors to consider in the sense that some people and some devices have difficulty acquiring the biometric sample, so users end up repeatedly having to to provide it for, for registration or for authentication. You can have the problem of false rejection, which from the user perspective can become bothersome. So you know, if, I, if I type my password wrongly, I realize it's me that's done it wrong, it's my failing. If the biometric tells me, no, you're not you, that's not my fault, that's the technology. So it, it actually builds up potentially more resentment more quickly against the technology than passwords would. And, okay, we've got examples of this that are coming again into mobile devices. Um, so Android has got the face unlock approach. Um, so you hold the device up. Anybody use this particular one? Hold the device up, and if it recognizes your face, it unlocks, and it's your device to use. Um, but it's not necessarily a universal solution. If you're in a dark environment, then it can't use the camera to pick up your face, and so it, it reverts to using PIN or password, whatever your fallback authentication method is, and so that could be a downside. And also, it's presented more as a mechanism for convenience rather than security, in the sense that the original version, which we're demonstrating in this, this uh, picture, this is taken from a, a video on our iTunes U site. This is my colleague Nathan Clark holding, up, or holding um, his Android device and holding up to it an iPhone with a picture of his face on it, and the Android device happily unlocks in response to a picture of him. Um, so in more recent versions of it, they've got liveness detection, so looking for, I don't know if it's blinking or eye movements, but even that, they've been shown to be 
vulnerable by having a, a picture of the, the user with eye holes cut in it, and then you can move your eyes or blink behind that, and that will fool the system. So what we've done at Plymouth, we've tried to look at some of this in the context of combining techniques on a, a device. So we've got a slightly older style of mobile device here, but it had a number of capture um, potentials that we wanted to use. So we've got, for example, a touch screen that you can use for gesture or signature recognition, a microphone through which you can do voice verification, the keyboard on which you can do keystroke dynamics, authenticating by the way somebody types, a camera for doing face recognition, and you can more generally profile the utilization of services on the device. So what types of applications and data does somebody utilize? What times of day do they normally use the device? And potentially none of these things would be sufficient in isolation, but bringing them together within an intelligent monitoring system gives you several potential feeds to use. Notably, it also has a fingerprint reader, but within the prototype we developed, we didn't want to use that because that requires an explicit security-related action. That thing is there for nothing other than security, whereas all the rest is leveraging aspects of the device that are already there for productive purposes. So I mentioned keystroke dynamics, the ability to authenticate somebody by the way they type. This is an area of fairly long-standing research for us at Plymouth. We've done it on desktop and laptop devices, full keyboards. We've also done it on a succession of mobile devices, touch screens and devices with actual buttons, if we remember them. Um, so we've done it for entry of PIN numbers, for passwords, we've done it for entry of SMS messages on mobile devices. Um, and I say it's good in the sense that it requires no additional hardware, you're leveraging something that's already there, and it's non-intrusive. You can apply it in the context of entry on the keyboard that somebody's already making. And you can use it as a means of password hardening. So, for example, somebody can type their password as normal, but it's not just what they type, it's how they type it that's then being looked at. And you can now see commercial implementations of a Norwegian company, for example, BehaviorSec, that has, well, keystroke dynamics and um, gesture recognition on mobile devices. Okay, coming towards the end, there's a number of factors that you could consider across these different devices or different methods. So the mental effort which the techniques might require is variable. So uh, does it rely on the user's ability to memorize and recall things? Are they convenient? How, how much effort, how much time is involved? How applicable are they to different types of devices? And how flexible are they in the event that you want to change your login credentials? So uh, the answer for passwords would be one thing, the answer for graphical authentication would be another, and the answer for biometrics would be different again. There is no single technique which ticks all the boxes wonderfully in all contexts. So it is a question of making an informed decision. So moving towards the end, clearly we're not going to say authentication is, is any less important now than it ever was, but passwords don't seem to be showing any immediate signs of going away. There are still plenty of implementations, and moreover, they're required in more and more contexts, whether it's something for a security purpose or just that the site wants to register you as a user and be able to track your use of the site, you're being required to create a password. And there isn't a best method. I'm not going to stand here and say that, no, everything needs to be biometrics, everything needs to be token-based. It is context-dependent. You've got to think about what scenario you're trying to, to realize. So a couple of views on whether passwords will disappear. Here, um, from just last week, Michael Barrett, the CISO for PayPal, and also notably in this context, the president of the FIDO Alliance, the Fast Identity Online Alliance, so this is a new technology, new protocol that's intended to enable um, stronger authentication to websites in an online context. And the, the, if you like, the, the motto, the, the catchphrase of this alliance is forget passwords. So FIDO Alliance protocol allows, a user, allows users a choice of authentication mechanism or me method while shifting control to providers who can make authentication um, user transparent and limit the risk of fraud. So, I say you can read more about what they're trying to do on their site, but that's one view, so it's limiting the, the future potential of passwords. Another view from uh, Eugene Kaspersky, who we did an um, interview discussion with a couple of weeks ago as well, back in April, so asked him about the ongoing prevalence of passwords. The password is good, and I think it will stay for years. The question is about password management, and of course that goes back to what I was saying right at the start. 
So it's not that passwords can't provide good security, it's that passwords often don't because of the way we use them. So back to some of the basics in terms of how we might help users use them better. So here's a, what I would say is an easy to remember password. It's not that complicated. Um, it's got the required upper and lower case, punctuation symbols, numbers, etc. Yeah, reasonably easy to remember. Well, perhaps it is if you then understand how I remember it. Again, it's not my password for anything. Don't try and use it anywhere. But here it's just based on the memorizing a particular phrase and concatenating that into a sequence of characters that you can associate with it. So that's one method that you could use. Another coping strategy is, well, okay, um, if you have to have a password for an account that you don't actually have any value for, just use the same one all the time. Okay? It, if it's not protecting sensitive information, some of those rules go out of the window, as long as you're not using the same password on accounts that you do actually value. If the account has a value, then you need, of course, to use a decent password and one that you're not reusing elsewhere. But even then, you've potentially got some means of not having to remember it, because you can choose the password and then forget all about it, if the site has got a decent password reset mechanism. So, provided you can reset the password once you've forgotten, if it's a site you're not going to use very often, um, and you're prepared to go through the 30 to 60 seconds of process required to do the reset procedure and then just select yourself a new password each time you want to use it, that's a way of managing that particular approach. So the crucial thing then becomes the protection of, for example, your email account where password reset messages will get sent to. Um, and perhaps considering having a separate email account that's well protected specifically for that purpose would be better than using your normal email account. Another thing to be aware of is the password reminder. So I mentioned that you have some sites that do password reset, some that will give you a password reminder, which in many cases is sending the password directly to you in plain text to your normal email account. So here's an example, interestingly, from Intego Security. Um, from just on the 4th of May, I had calls to need to recover the password. I couldn't remember it. Um, and they sent it to me in plain text through email, which is fine if it's me that's receiving it, but not quite so fine if it's somebody else who might be looking at the screen or have managed to get unauthorized access to my account. So it gives more opportunity to an imposter. Um, they can use the password now without you noticing. A password reset mechanism, by contrast, okay, they might be able to get the reset message, but if they change the password, you will notice that when you next try and use the account. Particularly risky if the same password is used on multiple accounts, because, of course, then you've got what the password <coughs> is to try, to try it elsewhere. You can use tools within the operating systems. So on MacOS, for example, there's a password assistant that you can easily access um, next to the password box when you're setting one, and it can make suggestions for the password, and it can, it can also... Uh, rate the passwords that you provide for yourself, so it gives you the quality rating. And we also have a website um, from our research centre. Um, uh, many online sites will allow you to test passwords, but here's one that we've got. You type the password in, it will give you a rating, it will tell you how the rating is composed, and it will give comments about the password you've selected. Does the story IP address? No. Nor indeed the password you type. Okay, okay, I was just wondering. <laughs> Now, we, we do this one at um, public showcases, so we get like schools and things in, for example, and, you know, and use it, and uh, the more astute amongst the participants will ask, are you logging the passwords? Mm -hmm. We'll say no, and they believe us, of course, and we are actually telling the truth, but of course they've got no more reason to believe us saying yes than no. So, other things to remember, passwords, even if you do all the stuff, only protects against some of the threats. So a keylogger, if you're typing in, can grab a strong password just as easy as it can grab a weak one. And users, refer back to the sphere phishing or more general phishing, users can still be tricked into giving the passwords away. So social engineering is a risk if you're just relying on secret knowledge. Changing passwords or having different ones for all systems won't scale. So needing to differentiate between the accounts that you value and the ones that are perhaps more of a throwaway nature. And finally... Um, I've used my full out, I do apologize. Um, contact details, Twitter thing, if anybody uses Twitter, and our research center website if you'd like to have a look at more of what we do. Thank you very much. <laughs>